Doctors Pauli and Eggerstedt, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this will be fun. I do hope so. Uh, so we're going to be talking today about Slothbot. But before we get into the details of that, I was hoping we could talk a little bit about the impetus for this project, um, You know, which I think lies in the fact that although the public has a professed appreciation for scientists and science, and although you know scientists are ranked as more trustworthy than almost any other field, um, that doesn't always show up in the way that people act and the choices that they make. And so I hoped you could just tell us a little bit about that and, you know, kind of what drives that phenomenon and how that feeds into a program like this one. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, just, just as you said, uh, the public has a great deal of confidence and faith in the scientific community. And that's been surveyed over and over again for, for decades, um, really rivaling that only of the, the U.S. military in our country. So there is a lot of um, faith in, in what scientists do and what we report and what we encourage or suggest, but that's not always really followed up by actionable change um, in the public or in the or or in the political are, arena. Um, and you know, much of that, you know, I believe and others believe has to do with the fact that um, while there's a lot of faith in that information, that information is only kind of narrowly distributed to people who are already engaged or switched on to these questions. And that means that we're missing these whole sectors of the public uh, that that might be interested, uh, but maybe just aren't completely aware of it. And that's especially, you know, appropriate when we start talking about conservation and environmental change. Um, scientists have been speaking for, for decades and decades about rapid climate change, about rapid uh, land use change, about um, the loss of species, the extinction crisis, the homogenization of ecosystems globally. And, you know, I, I generally have the sense that, that people believe that message, that they hear that message, at least those people that we do reach, uh, that they do understand that. <clears throat> but what many are beginning to recognize is that we're not reaching the broader public. We're not reaching um, everyone in the United States that is aware of all these changes. And so there's this really concerted effort now to try and broaden the scope of this information to really reach sectors of the public that might not be so aware um, of this information that we're generating or of these recommendations that we're providing. And so things like something like the sloth bot then really does engage a very different segment of the population. Uh, it engages people who are into tech, people who are into engineering and robotics. And so trying to merge an ecological understanding with kind of that segment of the population is really, you know, part of the benefit of something like um, a sloth bot. So, but, but I mean, John, in, in all honesty, when we built the sloth bot, right, I, I don't think neither you nor me thought that we were uh, building an effective, uh, you know, outreach and science policy platform. But then in hindsight, you take something as awesome as a robot and combine it with something even more awesome, meaning the sloth. And voila, you have something that actually has the potential to really, really be suggestive and, and, and get future generations of scientists and, and engineers excited about you know, climate change and conservation research. And Magnus hits a really great point, which is I don't think I really fully appreciated that the sloth bot, which was really more of kind of an academic interest, as Magnus said, I think that we were really interested in merging these two worlds to inform robotics with an understanding of a species in a natural environment. I didn't really appreciate that until my kids came down. They, re they read the magazine uh, The Week in review for, for kids. And my son came down and he said, Dad, look at this. How cool is this? There's a robot that's designed off of a sloth. And of course my kids know I've studied sloths. I've studied them for a decade now. They had no idea that I was part of that project and they weren't really turned on to it until they actually realized there was this ro robot at the other end of it. And it was kind of this moment standing in the hallway with my son Fritz where I realized like, holy cow, this is an incredible vehicle where it's sloths, which is captivates the public but also robots, which people are totally into, that it can really be an effective vehicle then 
to, to reach out to people who, who might not be uh, really tuned in to that kind of ecological thinking or conservation issues. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think one thing to note is, you know, your kids, uh, unlike my kids, my kids would have lost interest in it the moment they found out I was associated with it in any way. Uh, <laughs> but uh, before we go too far into, you know, why the Slothbot is and how it engages the public and things like that, I should ask you, what is the Slothbot and why a sloth? Yeah, I, why not? Uh, no, but... Uh, the genesis of the sloth bot was really, I got increasingly interested in, in robots that are out in natural environments for really long periods of time. And, and that is something that we as roboticists typically don't deal with, right? We design our robots to work a couple of times in, in a lab, and then we put it on a, in a manufacturing environment or, a, or a, a warehouse where you can actually engineer the environment. You have people that can go in and do maintenance on the robots. But if they're out for, for an entire season amongst the plants on a farm field, say, uh, you really need to think differently about the design. And I just thought that, you know, now we need to understand the coupling between robot and its environment. And ecology seems like a really fruitful place to start. And not only that, energy maintenance and, and being smart about spending energy as you move around in the world really matters. So why not actually look at really slow or low energy lifestyle animals? So uh, sloths seemed like a good place to start. I have uh, always found them kind of cool. Uh, so I Googled sloth ecology and uh, John's name showed up and I shot him an email saying, hey man, are you in? Do you want to build the world's slowest robot? And uh, John responded and said, yes. And uh, and that, that was kind of the, the, the starting point, just this idea of trying to build a robot or design a robot that, that in some sense mimics the, the kind of leisurely, low energy lifestyle of a sloth that, that can be present in a natural environment for really long periods of time. So that was my academic or my robotics interest is just a design paradigm. But then John realized that, you know what, this could actually be useful to ecologists. So. I'm teeing you up here, John. Yeah, I mean, I, that, 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 that's the origin, was a random email I received from a roboticist in Atlanta talking about how we could use an ecological understanding to design a robot to be uh, out in the environment for extended period of times and really thinking about um, energy savings, right? Uh, a low input uh, robot. And uh, Magnus, hit the nail on the head in thinking about sloths, frankly. Um, they really have a, a suite of exquisite adaptations to limit energetic expenditure. So uh, you guessed the right species, Magnus. That was, that was your first good move. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that is um, tree sloths have this really constrained existence that they need to, to eke out. Um, you know, over one third of terrestrial earth is covered by forests, but arboreal folivores, that is animals that live in trees and eat leaves are exceedingly rare. It's less than two tenths of a percent of all mammalian species are arboreal folivores. And, you know, part of the thinking behind that rarity of a lifestyle really has to do with energetic constraints that arboreal folivores are faced with kind of two ends of constraints that they need to, to work out in terms of, you know, adaptive fixes, uh, if you will. And that is that they need to be, first of all, large enough to be able to hold the gut machinery to be able to digest effectively leaves, which are structurally complex, chemically complex. They don't hold a lot of um, energetic nutrition associated with it. So they need to be big. And that's why we see so many herbivores are big bodied animals to be able to carry around things to digest uh, that resource effectively. But for our boreal folivores, they're faced with another trick. And that is they also need to be small enough to be able to get to their resource in the trees. So it's this very tightly constrained window that they need to operate in large enough to be able to digest the food, but small enough to be able to uh, get to that resource in the first place. 
And so as a consequence, what we see is our boreal folivores kind of across, you know, all species that do it, they have very low energetic requirements. And that's one way in which they kind of combat um, this, this con these constraints that they're facing is that they have constrained body size, but they also have really low basal metabolic rates, but also field metabolic rates. So there are physiological uh, savings that they have implicitly, but then they also match that with behavioral um, adaptations to try and limit that energetic expenditure. So sloths really are kind of one of the ideal, because they're an extreme arboreal full of war, really are an ideal species to think about it in terms of constraints, in terms and of it, energetic constraints. And in fact, if I may, may jump in, so when, when I started talking, when John started telling me all these exciting things, I heard, you know, blah, 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 blah. Arboreal folivore, blah, 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 constraints, blah, 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 tree canopies, blah, 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 low energy. And th those were trigger words for me. So what the Slothbot actually is, is a robot that is told literally to do nothing, spend no energy at all, just hang there under the trees on a wire. Uh, so that's what we're telling it to do, do nothing. But then there are constraints and the constraints are Subject to don't run out of battery. Make sure that you can always make it back to a sunny spot to recharge the batteries if you have to. So constraints are 100% responsible for the motion or movement of, of the robot. And, and it's, it's when I went, started going to robotics conferences and telling people, I'm building a robot that's doing nothing. People thought it was a little weird. Uh, but this idea of letting constraints be the generator of behavior as opposed to goals. Because robotics traditionally starts with, here's the goal for this robot. It's supposed to go from point A to point B as fast as possible or some other kind of uh, performance measure you're trying to either minimize or maximize. But here, literally the sloth bot is told, do nothing subject to the constraint that it always has the ability to go and recharge the, the batteries. So practically what it is, it's a robot hanging under the treetops on a, on a cable. It's suspended on a cable and uh, it has various uh, sensors on it to measure things having to do with uh, you know, the microclimate. So temperature, pressure, this and that. We have cameras on it to see if we can track uh, insects or birds around it. And every now and then it moves and it goes out and recharges the batteries and then it goes back under the trees and the treetops and and continues on with its leisurely lifestyle. Okay, so it sounds like, you know, the sloth bot and the sloth are in a sense, you know, on the back end also very similar in that they're both, you know, not having a particularly energy dense source of food as it were. And, you know, they're facing very similar constraints in terms of, you know, movement therefore, and, you know, their ability to get out and do things. So, you know, there, there are similarities, not just in terms of what we see, but also in terms of what underlies that. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I think the, you know, the, the, the idea behind the sloth bot is to, you know, essentially mimic some of those characteristics. And, you know, as Magnus just alluded to that, you know, the, the vast majority of a, a, a tree sloth's day is really not doing a whole lot that you'll see a sloth will move around. It'll move around to forage. It'll move around to bathe in the sunlight early in the morning. They'll move back into dappled shade during the day. Um, but other than that, it really is, it's not, it's not going out on these big forays, you know, every day. It, it's, a, it's a pretty static existence. And that is all really designed around trying to minimize that energetic expenditure. And our research group has shown that sloths have the lowest field metabolic rate uh, for, for any mammal. Um, and, and that they really are successful in minimizing that expenditure. And that, that has to do with behavior, like I said, in terms of minimizing movement, but it also has to do with really cool adaptations around um, thermoregulation. They're actually quite heterothermic in the field as well. So they let their body temperatures fluctuate quite a bit and they get you know dramatic energetic savings by allowing that body temperature um, to vary. So it, it really is for a sloth, a tree sloth now, there's really a kind of a, you know, uh, a suite of adaptations they have to, to limit that energetic expenditure. And, and circling back to the beginning of the conversation, I mean, once me and John figured out that, you know, we can, we can take what's 
what we've just learned here about constraints as drivers of behaviors and then at least my rather you know, maybe perhaps naive uh, understanding of ecology and turn that into a design. What we then did is we, we produced a shell for the sloth bot that made it look vaguely like a sloth. I mean, it's, it's kind of cute. And then uh, we put it up in uh, what's called the canopy walk at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens. So this is a, an elevated walkway through the treetops in the Botanical Garden. And the idea is, you know, it's just there. And uh, they have hundreds of thousands of visitors uh, each year. And a lot of them are kids. And this is where all of a sudden this innocent looking uh, little robot uh, went from being a, a curiosity to something that has the potential to actually influence people's view of, of science and maybe the importance of taking care of this planet that we're on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, one of the things, too, is that it's you're getting that messaging in, in a way that's not um, it's not hard to digest. This is a positive message. It's not, you know, kind of the the doom and gloom that oftentimes we have, could find ourselves sinking into when we discuss, you know, things like climate change. You, you nailed it. And I think, you know, I think that's what um, conservation biologists are increasingly realizing <clears throat> is that not only do we have to expand kind of the breadth of who we reach with our messaging, but it's also one that, um, you know, fatalism or cynicism or negative messaging only can take you so far in motivating uh, people. Um, and I think increasingly thinking of our science as something that's exciting, as an exciting vehicle to deliver um, information to people, I think is something that we're really kind of beginning to, to, to you know, grapple with in conservation biology is, is that positive messaging can be just as effective to get people excited about ideas, just like Magnus said, to get people excited to think about sloths and neotropical forests and what that means and how cool these species are. Um, I, think that's a, I think that's a much more productive line for conservation biologists to move down rather than just you know, telling people every day bad news. That, that needs to be coupled with excitement and enthusiasm and creativity. And I think, I think the, the, the sloth bot does achieve that. And, and personally, one thing that has made me really, really excited is uh, through my conversations with John, this, this idea that also as a roboticist, I can actually help field ecologists gather data and the idea that maybe we can in the future foresee you know, a swarm of sloth bots out there in, in various ecosystems, measuring things and actually letting us collect data over long periods of time that we otherwise would have a hard time getting. So I am really personally excited about, you know, because I've learned a lot from ecologists. If I could actually provide a platform that would give something back to the field of ecology, to me, that's that's terribly exciting. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that, that that is going to be the case. Yeah, and you've uh, you've anticipated my next question, which is you know kind of the what's next for the sloth bot. Um, it, it's it's obviously performing a very important role in terms of you know uh, outreach and engagement with the public. You know, are, are there any plans underway to you know use it as an ecological monitoring tool? Um, you know, potentially a, a self restoring. Uh, it's not a cam- it's a mobile camera trap in some sense, of, um, of, or, or a way of gathering information while you're out there. Yeah, it's a mobile camera trap that can go out and recharge and never runs out of battery. So th- that's it. And can move and actually slowly follow things around if it needs to. But, but uh, before the pandemic hit, uh, me and John had talked quite a bit about the, the wonders of deploying the sloth bot down. There is a cacao plantation that I'm actually going to let John talk a little bit more about. But, but this idea of wouldn't it be cool if we could use the sloth bot to actually monitor sloths? Uh, to go go full circle, I mean, to me that would be uh, mind-blowingly exciting. But but to me, that's that's one of the the big ambitions that I have is I now want to deploy this. I would love for this lost bot to travel the world or its cousins to travel the world down to South America or in other terrestrial interesting ecosystems where where it could actually do some some good. And, and, and I agree. I think that, you know, the, the idea of getting these out into the field um, would be exciting for ecologists because one thing that we, you know, we do a lot of in my, my research group is we study microclimates, just as Magnus was saying, that this can measure uh, fine scale, you know, abiotic conditions within the forest. 
And that can be challenging, especially when microclimates are dynamic. And having something that's that's mobile, something that's you know somewhat permanent, that can be moving across a landscape and taking measurements um, continuously is really appealing. And that's something that we spend a lot of time as field ecologists in the field collecting that data, um, going out and measuring these particular micro microclimates or deploying various you know, data loggers, but those are static. Those can't be relocated or those can't automatically move to new places. And often for microclimate work, you know, they, they change and we're really interested in what the temperature of the canopy is, you know, versus mid-story versus low throughout a day. And having something that can move uh, and is, as I said, kind of semi-permanent would, would really be, a, you know, an advantage to have in the field. So, you know, one last thing I wanted to touch on before we close out is the, you know, the issue of collaborating across fields. Uh, we often talk about collaborations within biology and oftentimes those, you know, those seem like enormous gulfs. Um, what's the experience been like of collaborating between, you know, robotics and ecology and conservation? I, I have found it deeply rewarding. Um, that is to say, just as, as you, you know, you mentioned that we often talk about multidisciplinary science. Um, and I'm, I'm just as culpable as anybody. Usually when we talk about multidisciplinary science, we're even within ecology you know, certainly within biology is 99.9% .9 of all my collaborations. And, and that is fruitful and that is good. And that is, you know, important and substantive collaborations that I, I thoroughly enjoy and learn a lot from. But I also think there's a lot of value in really reaching outside of your discipline. And um, this work with Magnus has brought me uh, to conferences, uh, to departments, to collaborators, uh, with scientists who think fundamentally differently um, about their work than I do. And, and that's been profoundly rewarding and something that I've just, I've just gotten a lot out of. Um, and, and that's also uh, been reciprocated in the sense that, you know, we've had Magnus come up to visit Madison and give a, a talk to the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology on robotics. And it was something that was one of our best seminars, um, really just kind of bridging these really, you know, at least ostensibly disparate, you know, fields of inquiry and, and really helping at least me to, to think differently about my own science through the lens of a, a very different um, disciplinary track. Yeah, I, I can echo that. I, it, this has been nothing but, but fun. And robotics is a little weird as a discipline because the world around us is filled with examples of you know, organisms that can move quite effectively through an environment or people that are sometimes pretty good at thinking. So things like artificial intelligence or, or mobility or how do we think about robots moving around in the world. There are tons of examples in nature out there that we can look at. So uh, Meaning, you know, people, animals, sloths, insects, fish. I mean, they're, they're just, the inspiration is endless from the, from the natural world. And, and uh, roboticists tend to focus primarily on, you know, how do horses move their legs as opposed to, you know, the, the kind of higher level behavioral question. So I actually think what we have started has the potential to have real impact in the world of, of robotics. Uh, as just a different way of thinking about the discipline. I also got to say that biologists, so thanks to John, I've now been introduced to tons of them, ecologists and biologists, and they're fundamentally generous with their knowledge. And, and they seem genuinely excited that someone like me <laughs> wants to know about what, what they're doing. Uh, but, but no, I, uh, I, I mean, I organized a, a major conference on the science of autonomy. And I had John as a, as a plenary speaker talking about sloths and, and all these roboticists and uh, computer scientists really, really thought this was an amazing talk just because it forced us as a community to think a little differently about what we were doing. So uh, I think we should do more of this. This is really, really ultimately where, where interesting